Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne Chapter 14 In which Phileas Fogg descends the whole length of the beautiful valley of the Ganges without ever thinking of seeing it. The rash exploit had been accomplished, and for an hour Passepartout laughed gaily at his, his success. Sir Francis pressed the worthy fellow's hand, and his master said, Well done, which from him was high commendation. To which Passepartout replied that all the credit of the affair belonged to Mr. Fogg. As for him, he had only been struck with a queer idea, and he laughed to think that for a few moments he, Passepartout, the ex-gymnast, ex-sergeant fireman, had been the spouse of a charming woman, a venerable embalmed Raja. As for the young Indian woman, she had been unconscious throughout of what was passing, and now, wrapped up in a traveling blanket, was reposing in one of the howdahs. The elephant, thanks to the skillful guidance of the Parsi, was advancing rapidly through the still darksome forest, and an hour after leaving the pagoda, had crossed a vast plain. They made a halt at seven o'clock, the young woman being still in a state of complete prostration. The guide made her drink a little brandy and water, but the drowsiness which stupefied her could not yet be shaken off. Sir Francis, who was familiar with the effects of the intoxication produced by the fumes of hemp, reassured his companions on her account but he was more disturbed at the prospect of her future fate. He told Phileas Fogg that should Aouda remain in India, she would inevitably fall again into the hands of her executioners. These fanatics were scattered throughout the county and would, despite the English pro police, recover their victim at the Madras, Bombay, or Calcutta. She would only be safe by quitting India forever. Phileas Fogg replied that he would reflect upon the matter. The station at Allahabad, Al Allahabad was reached about 10 o'clock, and the interrupted line of railway being resumed would enable them to reach Calcutta in less than 24 hours. Phileas Fogg would thus be able to arrive in time to take the steamer which left Calcutta the next day, October 25th, at noon, for Hong Kong. The young woman was placed in one of the waiting rooms of the station, whilst Passepartout was charged with purchasing for her various articles of toilet, a dress, shawl, and some furs, for which his master gave him unlimited credit. Passepartout started off forthwith and found himself in the streets of Allahabad, that is, the city of God, one of the most venerated in India, being built at the junction of the two sacred rivers, Ganges and Jumna, the waters of which attract pilgrims from every part of the peninsula. The Ganges, according to the lengths of the Ramayana, rises in heaven, whence, owing to Brahma's agency, it descends to the earth. Passepartout, made it a point, as he made his purchases, to take a good look at the city. It was formerly defended by a noble fort, which has since become a state prison. Its com commerce was dwindled away, and Passepartout in vain looked about him for such a bazaar as he used to frequent in Regent Street. At last he came upon an elderly, crusty Jew, who sold second-hand articles, and from whom he purchased a dress and scotch stuff, a large mantle, and a fine otter skin pelisse, for which he did not hesitate to pay seventy-five pounds. He then returned triumphantly to the station. The influence to which the priest of the Pelagi had subjected Aouda began gradually to yield, and she became more herself so that her fine eyes resumed all their soft Indian expression. When the poet king, Ukaf Udal, 
celebrates the charms of the queen of Amanagra, he speaks thus, Her shining tresses, divided in two parts, encircle the harmonious contour of her white and delicate cheeks, brilliant in their glow and freshness. Her ebony brows have the form and charm of the bow of Kama, the god of love and beneath her long silken lashes the purest reflections and a celestial light swim. As in the sacred lakes of Himalaya, in the black pupils of her great clear eyes, her teeth, fine, equal, and white, glitter between her smiling lips like dewdrops in a passion flower's half-enveloped breast. Her delicately formed ears, her vermilion hands, her little feet, curved and tender as the lotus bud, glitter with the brilliancy of the loveliest pearls of Celion, the most dazzling diamonds of Golconda. Her narrow and supple waist, which a hand may clasp around, sets forth the outline of her rounded figure and the beauty of her bosom, where youth in its flower displays the wealth of its treasures, and beneath the silken folds of her tunic she seems to have been modeled in pure silver, by the godlike hand of Vikvarkama, the immortal sculptor. It is enough to say, without applying this poetical rhapsody to Aouda, that she was a charming woman, in all the European acceptation of the phrase. She spoke English with great purity, and the guide had not exaggerated in saying that the young Parsi had been transformed by her bringing up. The train was about to start from Allahabad, and Mr. Fogg proceeded to pay the guide the price agreed upon for his service, and not a farthing more, which astonished Passepartout, who remembered all that his master owed to the guide's devotion. He had, indeed, risked his life in the adventure at Pelagi, and, if he should be caught afterwards by the Indians, he would with difficulty escape their vengeance. Keone, also, must be disposed of. What should be done with the elephant, which had been so dearly purchased? Phileas Fogg had already determined this question. Parsi, said he to the guide, you have been service, serviceable and de devoted. I have paid for your service, but not for your devotion. Would you like to have this elephant? He is yours. The guide's eyes glistened. <clears throat> your honor is giving me a fortune, cried he. Take him, guide, returned the fog, and I shall still be your debtor. Good, exclaimed Passepartout. Take him, friend. Keone is a brave and faithful beast. And going up to the elephant, he gave him several lumps of sugar, saying, Here, Keone, here, here. The elephant grunted out his satisfaction, and clasping Passepartout around the waist with his trunk, lifted him as high as his head. Passepartout, not in the least alarmed, caressed the animal, which replaced him gently on the ground. Soon after, Phileas Fogg, Sir Francis Cromarty, and Passepartout installed in a carriage with Aouda, who had the best seat, were whirling at full speed towards Benares. It was a run of 80 miles and was accomplished in two hours. During the journey, the young woman fully recovered her senses. What was her astonishment to find herself in this carriage on the railway, dressed in European habiliments, and with travelers who were quite strangers to her. Her companions first set above about fully reviving her with a little liquor, and then Sir Francis narrated to her what had passed, dwelling upon the courage with which Phileas Fogg had not hesitated to risk his life to save her, and recounting the happy sequel of the venture, the result of Passepartout's rash idea. Mr. Fogg said nothing, while Passepartout, abashed, kept repeating that it wasn't worth telling. Aouda pathetically thanked her deliverers, rather than tears than words, with tears than words. Her fine eyes interpreted her gratitude better than her lips. Then, as her thoughts strayed back to the scene of the sacrifice, and recalled the dangers which still menaced her, she shuddered with terror. 
Phileas Fogg understood what was passing in Aouda's mind, and offered, in order to reassure her, to escort her to Hong Kong, where she might remain safely until the affair was hushed up, an offer which she eagerly and gratefully accepted. She had, it seems, a Parsi relation, who was one of the principal merchants of Hong Kong, which is wholly an English city, though on an island on the Chinese coast. At half past twelve, the train stopped at Benares. The Brahmin legends assert that this city is built on the site of the ancient Kasi, which, like Muhammad's tomb, was once suspended between heaven and earth. Though the Benares of today, which the Orientalists call the Athens of India, stands quite unpoetically on the solid earth, Passepartout caught glimpse of its brick houses and clay huts, giving the aspect of desolation to the place as the train entered it. Benares was Sir Francis Cromarty's destination, the troops he was rejoining being encamped some miles northward of the city. He bade adieu to Phileas Fogg, wishing him all success and expressing the hope that he would come that, that way again in a less original but more profitable fashion. Mr. Fogg lightly pressed him by the hand. Parting of Aouda, who did not forget that she owed to Sir Francis, betrayed more warmth, and, as for Passepartout, he received a hearty shake of the hand from the gallant general. The railway, on leaving Benares, passed for a while along the valley of the Ganges. Through the windows of the car carriage, the travelers had glimpses of the d diversified landscape of Bihar with its mountains clothed in verdure, its fields of barley, wheat, and corn, its jungles peopled with green alligators, its neat villages, and its still thickly-leaved forests. Elephants were bathing in the waters of the sacred river, and groups of Indians, despite the advanced season and chilly air, were performing solemnly their pious abl ablutions. These were fervent, Brahmins, the bitterest foes of Buddhism, their deities being Vishnu, the solar god, Shiva, the divine impersonation of natural forces, and Brahma, the supreme ruler of priests and legislators, what would these divinities think of India? Angelicized as it is today, with steamers whistling and scudding along the Ganges, Frightening the gulls which float upon its surface, the turtles swarming along its banks, and the faithful dwelling upon its borders. The panorama passed before their eyes like a flash, save when the steam concealed it fitfully from the view. The travelers could scarcely discern the fort of Chupini, twenty miles southwestward from the Benares, the ancient stronghold of the Rajas of Behar or Gazipur and its famous rosewater factories, or the tomb of Lord Cornwallis rising on the left bank of the Ganges, the fortified town of Buxar, or Patna, a large manufacturing and trading place where it is held the principal opium market of India, or Mongkir, a more than European town where it is as English as Manchester or Birmingham, with its iron foundries, edge tool factories, and high chimneys puffing clouds of black smoke heavenward. Night came on. The train passed on at full speed, in the midst of the roaring of the tigers, bears, and wolves, which fled before the locomotive. And the marvels of Bengal, Golconda, Ruin, Gao, Murshibahada, and the, the ancient capital, Burdwan, Hugli, and the French town of Chandelunor, where Passepartout would have been proud to see his country's flag flying, were hidden from their view in the darkness. Calcutta was reached at seven in the morning, and the packet left for Hong Kong at noon, so that Phileas Fogg had five hours before him. According to his journal, he was due at Calcutta on the 25th of October, 
and that was the exact date of his actual arrival. He was, therefore, neither behind hand nor ahead of time. The two days gained between London and Bombay had been lost, as has been seen in the journey across India, but it is not to be supposed that Phileas Fogg regretted them. 